It is now time for the offering. When God has been good to us, it makes sense that we should be good and thankful to give back to God as he has been good to us. Offering baskets are at the rear and over here on, in the front. So if on your way out, if you have not given, we ask that you consider giving. Let us pray. Eternal Lord, our God, we thank you for the opportunity to give. You are so kind, gracious, and loving towards us. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to give back to you. We obviously can't give back in the same measure that you've given to us. But we thank you nonetheless. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. scripture this morning is um, Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. Reading from the Philippians, from the uh, New International Versions. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown. Stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Euodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. The word, let's pray. Thank you, God, for your word. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So this being my farewell sermon, I was tempted to preach one of my oldies, but decided against it because I wanted to offer you something fresh and relevant, but I couldn't bypass the introduction of an oldie that I preached once. The sermon was based on one of my favorite television shows that ran from 1959 to 1965. Now, if you all were, were in love with Rawhide, give it, give it an amen, please. Yes, all right. 
So you'll remember, and my, one of my favorite actors was Clint Eastwood. So I want you to hear just the beginning. John, could you play it for us, please? Yeah. For the uninformed, Rawhide was about a team of cattle drovers who periodically encountered trouble on the trail or in whatever towns they stopped nearby to rest the cattle. Well, church, you are about to receive Pastor Savage Freeze next Sunday, and you won't hear him say, head him up, move him out. But in a sense, that'll be his focus. He'll be leading you on a new journey of ministry and this community of faith, fellowship, and service. So let me be the one to say, hit him up, move him out. But as you begin your new journey with Pastor Freeze, let me recommend that you all do as the Apostle Paul instructed the Philippians. Stand firm. Listen to him. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. To begin with, I have a similar affection for you as Paul did for the Philippians. He loved the Philippians as I have grown to love you over the past three years. Each passing week, my affection has increased for each of you as worshipers and as individuals. The anthem choir, Muddy Boots, the cabinet, the, um, the, the, the Bible study, the Sunday school, the mission team, and especially you children and youth. You've got a sense of purpose and drive that would make any pastor fond of you. And as Paul wrote to the Philippians, whom he hadn't seen in some time, it won't be long before I long for you even more. Even though I will be forced to contain my longing, but both of our denominations have a keep-away rule for pastors who leave a congregation. They require me to keep my distance from you, no matter how much I long for you. That distance is so that departing pastors don't get in the new pastor's way. It sometimes feels really harsh because part of the work of ministry is building relationships. And then to have to sever them on the last Sunday of my ministry seems cruel to both of us. Nevertheless, we must comply. Paul then lavishes compliments on the Philippians and calls them his joy and crown. I've told you before how much joy you've brought me during my three years with you. I can still not recall when I've laughed so much in my previous 29 years of pastoral ministry. You are a church that Pastor Freeze will enjoy and I hope have as much fun with. At the same time, pastoral ministry is a work that brings a concoction of joy, stress, worry, sometimes heartache, sometimes conflict, and sorrow. Therefore, you and Pastor Freeze all need to stand firm together. You must be 
able to stand firm regardless of what comes your way. Stand firm like the rock of Gibraltar, which actually is the prudential rock. Prudential insurance, that's the rock of Gibraltar. I didn't know that until I looked it up. And you must stand firm like the giant sequoias in the Sequoia National Park, which are now being threatened by the wildfires. Some sequoias have stood strong for as long as 3,000 years. You must stand firm like the rocks on the shore of Portland uh, Head Lighthouse in Cape Elizabeth, which is pictured on the front of your bulletin covers. No matter how violent or strong the waves, the storms and hurricanes that beat upon those rocks, those rocks stand firm to meet the next battering. You stood firm for 243 years, and the Lord needs you to be a continuing witness to a world that's full of sin, hatred, violence, ethnic bigotry, and ours is a world desperately in need of hope and salvation. But how will you stand firm? Stand firm first by rejoicing. That's why Paul tells us, rejoice in the Lord always. Then he sounds like an old-time cracked record. Scratched record. I will say it again. Rejoice, he says. Rejoice by singing the songs just the same way I had to stop you this morning. Stop, 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 stop. If you can't sing it with gusto, you need to stop and start it over again. It's a kind of, kind of hard to sing a song with joy without expressing joy in your voice and heart. So Paul tells us to rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice by remembering all of God's blessings. Rejoice and laugh during wor worship. Rejoice by recognizing what the author of Psalm 126 wrote. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad. God has given us four seasons. And there, you notice that they're always in the right order? God has given us water to drink, air to breathe, carbon to help our plants grow, rain to feed the plants and grass, and to restore the streams and rivers. Whenever the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir thinks about being glad, they always break in the song and start singing, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us give him praise. Let us rejoice and be glad. And every time I hear them sing that song, I not only sing along with them, I clap, I dance in place, I pat my feet, and I'm totally filled with joy. But it's not the song that fills me with joy. It's my thoughts about all the things that God has done in my life. I'm 70 years old. I threw, I've lived through my share of love and hatred. I was born just after the Second World War. I lived through the Cold War, the Korean War. I was in college during the Vietnam War. We all witnessed military conflicts in the Persian Desert Storm, Desert Shield, wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. We're still living through racism and efforts by po politicians to limit my ability and that of other black and brown people to vote freely, which is one of our inalienable rights as all American citizens are entitled. I personally lived through heartbreak, sickness, disease, and surgical procedures that have left me disabled. I've suffered the tragic deaths of my father, my mother, my brother, and yet the Lord is still blessing. He's blessed Debbie and I despite her brain surgery, her heart transplant, and her recent very scary and yet still mysterious hospitalization. All of these experiences were our boot camps to help us stand firm to meet new challenges that are surely coming our way. And if you can't rejoice over these life's outcomes, then y'all need to check your joy tanks because you may have sprung a leak. 
God, in essence, is telling all of us, no matter what is going on around us, stand firm. John, show that meme that I sent you. You got to stand firm. God says, I got your back. No matter what God is going on, no matter what is going on around us, God says, just stand firm. Stand firm. Do not be anxious about the future. Instead, no matter what the situation, whether the roof starts leaking or if the boiler breaks down or if there are financial challenges, if there are increases in the COVID positivity rates or additional domestic or international terrorist attacks on our nation, stand firm. Whether membership numbers rise or fall, stand firm. Whether worship attendance rises or falls, stand firm. No matter what, because the Lord has promised promise, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. And do not fear, or be, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. And as you consider the Lord's word, I offer you four words of counsel as you begin your new ministry with Pastor Freeze. First, stand firm in faith and be encouraged by the history of First Church of Jerusalem. Acts 16.5 says, So the churches were strengthened in the faith. And guess what happened? Scripture says, And they increased in numbers daily they stood firm in what in faith and as a result of standing firm in faith they increase in numbers secondly stand firm in the word because the lord spoke through isaiah and said in isaiah 40 verse 8 the grass withers the flower fades but the word of god The word of our God will stand forever. And if you stand firm in God's word, guess what happens with you? You stand firm in the word, and his word stands firm with you. Thirdly, stand firm in fellowship with each other. Because First Church of Jerusalem did the same. And look at what happened to them. Acts 2.46 says, So, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Stand firm. And the Lord will add to the church those who are being saved. Fourthly, stand firm in ministry with Pastor Freeze. Because he will be, starting Sunday, your under-shepherd. He is Jesus' hireling. Pastor Freeze is your pastor, your preacher, your teacher, your counselor. He is your servant leader who is intent to build you up to, cons- to be consistent with Ephesians 2.22 that reads, And in him you too are being built together. You, the congregation, and Pastor Freeze are being built together to become a dwelling which God lives by his spirit. Pastor Freeze will visit you when you're hospitalized, comfort you when you grieve, consecrate your weddings, celebrate new faith conversions, baptize new believers, confirm your growing in, in the <coughs> confirm youth growing in their <coughs> in their faith, excuse me. Confirm youth growing in their faith, and when you find yourself in a state of shame, 
and don't know what to do, your pastor will be there to help and support you through it all. The pastor's ministry is to work with you. His work is to become one with you and to stand with you through all of the ups and downs that this church will encounter. The pastor's work is to help all members of the church achieve their full potential so that all can live up to their calling as stated in Romans 12, verses 3 to 8, which reads, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among this congregation, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one as a measure of faith. For as we have many members in this body, for all members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. In other words, Pastor Fries' mission is to help the church exercise their spiritual gifts and use them to serve other members in the world surrounding this congregation. The church has a lot of work to do, and it's not done just by worshiping. It's done by using all of your spiritual gifts to the glory and honor of God. And so I leave you with the wisdom and counsel of the Apostle Paul. Church, please stand right now. Please stand. I encourage and challenge you all to stand firm, to meet God's call to ministry, stand tall, to reach out to Red and Litchfield County with new evangelistic and outreach ministries, stand firm to lift up the cross of Jesus Christ, stand firm to sing the songs of Jesus, the stories that saved my life and that are saving the lives of others still today. Stand firm in order to restore the vitality of fellowship of First Church. Stand firm in your faith. Stand firm in the word of God, for it is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond anything that you might ever ask, think, or imagine. And finally, stand firm in ministry with Pastor Fries to secure the life and ministry of First Church. And when you stand firm in the faith, in the word, in fellowship, and in ministry of Pastor Fries, you will have honored the, the, the words of Pastor, Apostle Paul and all of your former pastors, even as Paul wrote. Whatever you have learned and received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord God. For the ministry that you've given to First Church of Winstead since over the course of 243 years, years Continue to bless that ministry, even in advance of Pastor Fries's arrival next Sunday. We ask your anointing on him and his beloved wife. We thank you, Lord, for this calling. And pray, Lord, that the calling that you placed on First Church will blend with the calling that you've placed on Pastor Fries's life. And the two, O oh Lord, together will stand firm on the word, in their faith, in fellowship, and in ministry together so that this church will continue to thrive and serve you in this present age until you call all of us home together. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen.
And now as we prepare for the benediction, I have a final request. As I raise my hand to offer the benediction, I ask you to open your hands to receive the benediction. And it goes as this. May the name of our Lord Jesus be glorified in you and you in him. According to the grace of our God, the Holy Spirit, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.